I am really excited to be here today. I think birds are way cool. I, so I study birds, and I just think they're, they're one of the neatest things out in nature. Nature is filled with all kinds of fascinating and amazing organisms. And uh, birds, for me, are, are way up there. But I really didn't want to sort of come here and tell you why I think birds are way cool. What I've tried to do is structure kind of a uh, choose your own adventure style of talk where uh, I want you to tell me why you think birds are way cool. And hopefully I've uh, prepared some material on those topics. So who wants to tell me why they think birds are way cool? Why are you here today? Yes. Thank you, Inez. Because they fly and they make us dream. That is great. So they fly. That's fantastic. Yeah. Why, why else? Yes. Sorry, they're, they're like us. We were both descended from reptiles. Yes. Um, OK, that's good. So something about their evolution, like their evolutionary history is interesting. And we have a lot in common with them. Yeah, that's right. They, they perceive, the, one reason I like birds is because they perceive the world in a roughly similar way as we do. So it's kind of easy to imagine being a, a bird soaring around up high. They see the world. Um, they have eyes like us. They hear. Uh, so I, I, it's easy for humans to kind of imagine being a bird. Um, but as, I, as I'll show you a little later, they actually perceive the world in somewhat different ways than we do. So, so uh, it's fun to imagine how they do that. What else? Yes. Different mating calls. So they sing in different ways. Um, they call in different ways. Yeah, that's a really fascinating thing. So in some of my research, I study their songs and, and calls. What else? Why else are bird, birds cool? Yes, you know this again. Yeah, beautiful feathers and colors and courtship. Anything else? Yes. Yeah, so yeah, and that's something that humans, for, for millennia, we imagined what it would be like to fly. Now we can sort of do that with airplanes and helicopters and gliders and things. But um, for a long, long time, they could do this thing flying that we could only imagine. And that was really special. We actually learned from them that it was possible to fly, right? Um, Leonardo da Vinci looked at birds, and the first flying machines he tried to design were, looked a lot like bird wings. Uh, OK, so those, that's great. You, you kind of hit upon a lot of the things that I uh, really think are neat about birds. So I, I've got material on these four different things. And uh, we have about 40 minutes. So we're probably not going to get through all of them. But I want to take kind of a vote on which you want to hear the most. So, so I've got they fly, they're beautiful, they're dinosaurs, and they sing. So how should we do a, a sort of vote? like? How many want to hear they fly first? OK, two. How many want to hear they're beautiful first? Three, four, five. How many they are dinosaurs? OK, I think that's going to win. And how many they sing? Well, the singing, I think, is second. So OK, let's, let's do dinosaurs. And then we'll see, uh, see how we do from there. So yeah, they, they essentially are little dinosaurs. And this is a somewhat new realization among uh, scientists. Uh, if I were giving this lecture 15, um, 20 years ago, I'd be presenting that we really don't know what they evolved from. They, they evolved from some kind of re uh, reptile, but we don't know if it was a dinosaur or some earlier form of rec reptile called a thecodont or, or something else. But in the last uh, 10 to 15 years, uh, a treasure trove of fossils have been discovered, uh, mainly in China, northeastern China in the Gobi Desert that have really clearly said birds are little dinosaurs. And this is just, I just wanted to show this. It shows some of the many fossils that have been used to, to um, lead to this discovery. And now, those are too small for you to see in detail, so I'm, I've got some close-ups of other ones. So this is probably the most famous. It's one of the, one of the most famous fossils of anything anywhere. Uh, and it's the Archaeopteryx. And so there have been nine uh, specimens of Archaeopteryx found. 
It was discovered in a quarry in Berlin in 1861. And what's the timing of, what's the significance of that timing that anyone can think of? 1861, what important book had been published a little while before? Yeah, Darwin's The Origin of Species has been to, uh, published just a few years before. And this was an amazing fossil because it seemed to provide sort of a link between birds and something else, the something else being reptiles. So here you have this thing that has, clearly has um, feathers here. It's got these, these four limbs with feathers. It's got a long tail with feathers. Uh, unlike modern birds, if you look closely, it's got teeth there. Um, I have a replica. This is not the original. The original must be in a safe somewhere. But this is a replica, a cast replica of Archaeopteryx. And if you come up afterwards, you'll be able to see that there's little teeth, teeth there. And a lot of the other structures of Archaeopteryx were reptile-like, like the long bony tail, uh, the, the bony head, some, uh, some of the things about the pelvis and so forth. And so it was clearly a bird. It had long um, uh, wings. It, it had um, asymmetrically shaped feathers. And it could clearly uh, glide, but probably could not fly as well as modern birds. Um, but it was clearly kind of reptilian as well. It had these reptile features. So it showed the link between birds and reptiles. But it really didn't show the link between birds and dinosaurs. That had to wait for a long time. So that was from about 150 million years ago, that, that rock. Here's what Archaeopteryx looks like. And here's a modern domestic pigeon, just to compare. And you can see a few, a few differences. Uh, one, the, the brain case is a lot bigger in modern birds than it was in Archaeopteryx. Uh, the, the, the wing uh, bones, the, they're separate fingers in Archaeopteryx, and they're more fused in modern birds. This keel, this big keel that when you carve a turkey or a chicken, that, that big bone in the middle, that, that is, all the flight muscles attached to that, that was just this tiny bone in Archaeopteryx. So that's been elaborated with the evolution of powered flight in modern birds. This long bony tail in Archaeopteryx has become this short pigeo style, it's called, where all the, the, um, the uh, arc, uh, all these bones are sort of fused together into a single thing. And the rib cage is much more solid in modern birds than it was in, in Archaeopteryx. OK, so let's just think of this on a long um, time scale. So this is sort of showing from 570 million years ago, a long time ago, to the present right here. And here, just this last Cenozoic period from 65 million years ago to the present, that's sort of expanded here. And we humans appear just in the last you know, million years or so. Um, but Archaeopteryx, right here, 150 million years ago, the first birds appeared. And dinosaurs were around at that time, too. They evolved around 240 million years ago, they appeared. And they went extinct, though, about 65 million years ago. Uh, the dinosaurs went extinct. But the birds survived. And it appears that birds are the only um, surviving group of dinosaurs. So what do I mean by the, they evolved from dinosaurs? Well, here are a bunch of different um, groups of dinosaurs. They were a fantastically diverse group. They were on the Earth for a long period of time. Uh, there were meat eaters, plant eaters, so forth. This one particular group of dinosaurs, the theropods. Can anyone name a, a, a theropod that they know about? Does anyone want to try to name a theropod that they, that's, that's that's kind of famous. Yeah, Maya? Tyrannosaurus rex was a theropod. And it turns out that birds, it's really clear now, birds evolve from theropods. Birds are a kind of theropod dinosaur. So when you see a, a picture of a T-Rex or go to a movie that has a T-Rex, you can think of a Tyrannosaurus rex and then a hummingbird and just think, wow, isn't that amazing how one thing evolved from the other? Uh, so anyway, what, what do I mean by the evidence that they evolved from theropods? Well, here's, here's something that was discovered in 1998 in China, so just 16 years ago. 
And this was one of the most important discoveries that really led people to think, okay, they really did evolve from dinosaurs. This thing is clearly not a flying bird, right? It, uh, here, but it does have feathers. So it was clearly a dinosaur. It was clearly a theropod dinosaur in its skeletal structure and so forth. In its walking on back legs, the front legs up like this. And it clearly had feathers. I don't know if you can see very well, but that's, that's a fossilized feather. And it takes special kind of rock to fossilize fe feathers, and that's why it took a while to find the appropriate kind of rock and, and those kinds of fossils. Uh, and here's, here's some more feathers here. It's hard to tell what's going on there. But anyway, the reconstruction is that it was essentially a theropod dinosaur with wing and tail feathers, but not enough to fly. And so this showed that feathers really evolved not for flight, per se, but feathers evolved much earlier um, for other purposes. Now, what, what other purposes could they have evolved for, feathers? Yeah. Yeah, so thermal regulation. So um, it turns out that, that uh, you know, birds and mammals were, were all endothermic. We produce our own heat. If you produce your own heat, you need a covering to con keep that heat in. Mammals do it with hair, fur. Um, birds do it with uh, feathers. And it turns out that there's more and more evidence that dinosaurs were also endothermic. At least m many groups of them were. And they probably evolved feathers in part for thermoregulation. Uh, what else? Why else would they develop feathers? What other purpose could they have had? You know, what? Courtship, yeah. So courtship um, meaning display. So maybe they were dis for display. You could make feathers colorful. You can make them big. You can, um, you can use them in all sorts of displays to other individuals. Here's another uh, fossil that was found around the same time, 1998, published in Nature. Uh, Caudipteryx, another theropod dinosaur with feathers and um, a feathered tail. And, but clearly not enough feathers to fly, just enough to display. So the arms were probably used for display. Here is one that's really cool, Microraptor. Uh, so Microraptor, it's a beautiful fossil here. It clearly has wings coming off the front limbs. But also look at this, these feathers coming off the back limbs. And this, this is sort of a reconstruction of what it looked like. There's been a lot of debate of whether it flew kind of in that formation or whether it was more like a biplane with the legs underneath and sort of two levels of feathers. Um, and they decided, though, it, by building models, the biplane one just crashed all the time. But this one was pretty stable and could glide for a long, long way. So anyway, it, it's an interesting uh, thing that they called a four-winged dinosaur from China. <clears throat> uh, here's another interesting fossil. came out in 2004. This is a, um, a fossil dinosaur. You see the head there, the neck kind of curling around the tail curling around like this. This is from the underside, and these long legs are folded up underneath it. So it's in a, it's in a little position sort of curled up. What does this tell us? Well, I guess it says it there. The, it's, the fossil uh, suggests that these dinosaurs were endothermic, meaning that they're conserving their own heat. They're producing their own heat and conserving it. It's mainly endothermic things that, that um, nestle up in that curled up position. So more and more evidence that dinosaurs are a lot like birds, and birds are a lot like dinosaurs. <clears throat> and just um, there's a lot to read here. Don't read all this. <laughs> I'm just putting it up there to give you a sense of the recency of discovery in this field. So this was published just last year, uh, well, less than a year ago. And these people uh, analyzed everything that's known about the phylogenetic tree of, of birds and dinosaurs, and they mapped on traits onto those relationships, who's related to whom. And they, they figured out that birds are essentially each group of dinosaurs that became smaller over time. That was the lineage that kind of led to birds. And so you can see this here. Uh, this, this graph on, on this side is showing the age. So we're, there's um, 65 million years or, or so. That's when most dinosaurs died. Um, the birds survived that, but 
and then going back from there to 240 million years ago. So you started with these large uh, dinosaurs here, and sort of as you go this way on this graph, that way, uh, things get smaller and smaller. And so at each split, there's kind of an, uh, a splitting of the dinosaur groups into two groups. One group stays big, another gets kind of smaller. And that keeps happening over and over and over. This rapid evolution right around 180, 170 million years ago towards smaller and smaller body size. And then right here, the Archaeopteryx appears. And you get this diversity of birds going on. Um, as that happened, as that smaller body size evolved, all kinds of other traits changed as well. So they, they looked at the rate of change of all kinds of other skeletal traits. And you can see that in these colors. So red is really fast, green is moderate, blue is slow. Most of these dinosaur lineages didn't change much over time. But each time it, along these, these lineages, you see green. That's faster evolution of these uh, skeletal traits. So essentially, the take-home message of this is a very fancy way of showing that you know, birds are just, when you take dinosaurs and, and evolve them towards smaller and smaller body size, you get the traits that birds have. <clears throat> so this is just showing it again. We've gone from large um, leg length to very small leg length. And there was this rapid evolution between 180 and 160 million years ago that led to, to birds. So that was in a paper called How Birds Became Birds. And this is just another figure kind of showing you some of the diversity of dinosaurs and that we can really think of birds as being just a, a form of dinosaur that happened to survive that extinction 65 million years ago. Um, so here's Archaeopteryx here, living birds right here. There's all kinds of little um, developments that happen, including hollow cylindrical feathers, tufted feathers, um, so, so on and so forth. OK, so the take-home message of that section is that birds are small dinosaurs. And uh, for this part, uh, you know, birds sing in amazing ways. We all hear them sing and, and so forth. And so rather than give a broad talk on um, singing, I thought I'd share a little bit about some of our own research on on bird song. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about wrens. Has anyone seen wrens around in this area? Yeah. And then greenish warblers, which you haven't seen in this area because they live in Asia. Uh, so the, there's a story about wrens. Um, these two species of wren, Pacific wren here and, and winter wren here, uh, can both be found in northeast British Columbia. But they used to be treated as a single species. And so um, some students and I went out uh, about 10 years ago, and we, we thought maybe th they sound different. There, there's an eastern form that sings one way and a western form that sings another. And we thought maybe they're separate species, in fact. So we found this area of northeast British Columbia where we could hear these two living side by side. And they had these very different song types. And so what, what I'm showing you here is a spectrogram. So there's time on this axis in seconds. And then this is frequency on this axis. So high pitch sound is up high. Low pitch sound is down low. And then the darkness is the kind of loudness of the, that frequency at that time. And I hope you can see this western song looks a lot different than this Eastern song. But I'm going to play them both for you, and we can figure them out. So first I'll play the Western one, because that's the one you can hear right around here. If you go into Pacific Spirit Park, um, so here it goes. So uh, I'm going to play that once more a little louder. OK, so a, an amazingly variable song. What you might be surprised to know is that each bird, each male bird, has about 100 different versions of these songs that it can sing, that it's carrying around in its head. Now let's hear the Eastern one. OK. 
Okay, so I, I hope you could hear there's a little bit of a difference between those songs, between the West and the East. And you can see it in these, these rapid up and down strokes here that that one doesn't have. This, the, the Eastern one has these low trills, and the Western one has these really high pitch trills. So you can easily hear that different, uh, difference. And it turns out these two species can hear that difference as well. And it turns out there's almost no interbreeding between this form and that form. So the females seem to recognize the differences in these songs and not like the males that have the opposite song. And so we tested that using genetics and, and that was true. So now, they're, now we humans treat them as separate species because that's what the birds do. Okay, so, but how did those two songs evolve? Uh, we'd like to know how one species gradually splits into two over time and how song changes during that process. So for that, I'm turning to this greenish warbler that I did a bunch of work on in, uh, in Asia. So this is a map of, of Asia. And here, right in the middle, you have the Tibetan Plateau. And then the Gobi Desert and Taklamakan Desert. These are desert areas where these warblers don't live because they eat uh, insects in forests. So they don't like deserts. But in the, in the mountains surrounding those areas that have forests in them, these birds uh, are found in those areas. So the colors represent different places where these greenish warblers breed. And the colors represent different types of those greenish warblers. So up here in Siberia, there are two types of these birds. Uh, this one's called the one-barred greenish warbler. This one's called the two-barred greenish warbler. Very subtle difference, right? Very, um, they're almost uh, drab, kind of boring looking birds, but they make up for that in their songs that they sing. And so what looks like two species based on plumage, I wanted to go out and find, do they sing different songs? And how have those different songs evolved? Now down through this chain of populations down here, you have these different forms. So Viridanus um, gradually turns into Ludlowi, and Trochiloides, Obscuratus, and then gradually becoming Plumbitarsus. And we have this hypothesis that this situation arose when a southern form down here in the Himalayas expanded like this along two pathways into Siberia, and they became more genetically different as they went and more different in behaviors such as song. And genetic evidence supported this scenario basically a south to northward movement along two pathways into Siberia, becoming different as they went. And now they don't interbreed up here. So what about song? Well, I, I want to first show you some songs from one individual down here in the south. So this is just a single bird. These are the nine song types that that single bird happened to sing. And you'll see that each song is constructed out of one um, syllable that's repeated like five times, OK? So let's hear those. OK, that was type one. Type two. Oh, I think we mixed up on the types. But anyway, we're hearing, OK. Somehow we didn't hear the first two, but then we heard these. But you get the point that it, it's, it's got these nine different types. I hope you can see the difference in, in between that and that and that and that, right? But they all consist of this sort of similar uh, structure to the song, uh, one syllable repeated like five or six times. OK, so that's where songs are simplest. That's down in the southern part of their range, way down here in the Himalayas at site LN. This is showing songs from one particular song from one bird from eight or nine, yeah, eight different populations around the ring. So we're going to start up here at West Siberia, Teletsk, and then we're going to move around the ring like this. And we, so we're going like that. And we're here, right in the middle, are this type of song that you just sang, that you just heard, site LN. So we'll play these and uh, see if you can hear the differences. That was West Siberia, Pellets Lake. Here's Ala Archa. Here's Pakistan. 
Manali, India. Langtang, Nepal. Ume Shan, uh, China. Xining, China. And up to East Siberia, Stolby. Okay, so what did you notice going around the ring there? Different. Yeah, how's it different? Yeah, thank you. So it's getting, it goes from very simple in the southern uh, songs. And then as you move northward into West Siberia, you get much longer and more complex songs. And you get the same when you, you move up to East Siberia, you get much longer and more complex songs. But the form of complexity, the way they're getting complex is very different in the two cases. So uh, you're, you're getting this high frequency range in West Siberia. It's a little hard to see, and you don't have as high a frequency range in East Siberia. You also have these large song units that I've labeled with letters um, that are internally complex in West Siberia. In East Siberia, you have these uh, repetitions of units, and more of a rolling structure to the song. But each bird has many, many different units it can sing in East Siberia. So there are different ways to get complex. And we were able to quantify this by measuring song variables. Um, so things like song length, maximum frequency, minimum frequency, number of units, and so forth. And then do some um, uh, analysis to kind of summarize the patterns overall. And what this is showing is kind of the results of that analysis, where we measured a whole bunch of songs, uh, we put them into the computer, and what the computer then does is try to spread the variation out along in two-dimensional space so that um, differences are shown by lots of distance on this chart. So basically, the West Siberian ones in blue here and the East Siberian ones in red have very different songs. There's a bunch of white space in the middle. But when you look down through this chain through the south, the songs come down this way and then go back up this way. And so there's this gradient in songs around the ring. So you have these two species that are genetically different in West and East Siberia that for the most part don't, don't interbreed with each other. They have very different songs. And we know that they don't recognize each other's songs either. We do playback experiments that show that. But as you move through the ring to the south, you get this gradual change in the songs. So it shows how two species are actually connected through evolution. Uh, um, and so you can picture this ancestral form of this bird that gradually evolved in these two directions, and the songs changed as they went. And we actually think one of the reasons that they changed like that is um, that there are different uh, sort of selection pressures and benefits and costs to singing that select for long and complex song in the north. It's been shown that in a lot of birds, the females like the males that have the most long and complex songs. It's a good indicator of overall sort of health and so forth. And so we think that that's what's happened during this expansion process. OK, so any questions about song before we move on to maybe one more uh, topic? All right. Yeah, question. Yeah. So that's a great question. So I didn't quite explain this fully, but that this um, these little ellipses here, these ovals, uh, are, are representing variation among individuals in that population. So in other words, like this this point TL, what what we did was go to that site, record a bunch of different birds, and for each bird, take a bunch of songs and then calculate all those variables, and then average it for each bird, and then average it for that population, but then take 
what's called the standard deviation <clears throat> in that population, which is a measurement of how much variation there is. And what this shows is the average, the mean, and then plus and minus a standard deviation at that site. So it's showing, it's illustrating the sort of amount of variation at that site. That's right, uh, good observation. There, there's much less variation in the original population than there is in these northern ones. You, you basically, um, there, the, the role of song and the amount of variation among individuals is much bigger in the northern populations than the south. Yeah. Song is just much more kind of interesting in the north in some way. So it's pointing to this common, there must have been some parallel reason for that more interesting song in the north. So they fly. So this is a, a Arctic tern, which is, is one of the most amazing flyers um, in the world. Well, perhaps the most. Um, and I'll, I'll show you why. Does anyone know why I'm saying that about the Arctic tern? Yeah. Yeah, they migrate not just pretty far, but really, really far. They, they migrate all the way from the Arctic to the Antarctic each year and back, uh, going about 35,000 kilometers per year. Frequent flyers, yeah. So uh, birds, well, this is kind of obvious, but obviously they're, they've been shaped by evolution to be incredibly good at flying. And so if, you, you know, I was talking about the teeth in Archaeopteryx. Why don't birds have teeth anymore? Why do they have, yeah. They're heavy, yeah. Yeah, they're heavy. Their teeth are very heavy, bony things, whereas the keratin structure of, of uh, beaks is very lightweight. So they've replaced that heavy, uh, the teeth, by this lightweight bill that's very, that can be shaped in many different ways over evolutionary time. They've replaced that long, um, bony tail by, by feathers that are very lightweight. So the, the vertebrae have all been pressed up into this little Little, little tail area. Um, they've got, they actually have a lot of vertebrae so that they can turn their head as they're flying because they, they need to be really flexible in terms of their, their, the way their head can turn compared to their body. Um, and uh, yeah, so they just have a lot of adaptations for, for flight. And if you compare um, birds with feathers to um, mammals that fly, namely bats, and then pterosaurs, another reptilian group that could fly. By the way, pterosaurs were not dinosaurs. They're, they're a, a different group, but, um, but they were a flying group of reptiles. Both bats and pterosaurs have to support those wing structures with long bones that go out to the tips of the wing. Whereas birds don't have to do that. They've replaced the bone with feathers that are much lighter weight and very strong and flexible at the same time. And so these feathers are quite amazing structures in many ways. We talked about how they evolved not for flight, but they're incredibly useful in flight. And they can do kind of amazing things like um, imagine, you, you know, you have this wing and on the downstroke, the feathers are arranged in a way that they lock sort of tight and they catch a lot of air going down. But on the upstroke, look, each one can turn like this and let air through. Imagine having a, 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 a airplane that did something like that. It'd be quite difficult to engineer, but uh, that's what they do. So feathers are very uh, strong yet, yet flexible structures. So here's the Arctic tern. It, it breeds way up in the Arctic, migrates way down to the oceans around Antarctica, and, and feeds. So it gets the best of the Arctic summer and the Antarctic summer, right? When it's winter up here, it's down in the Antarctic enjoying the summer down there. Pretty smart way to, to go. But they have to fly very, very far to do that. So they're incredibly good flyers. But lots of other species are also good flyers. Here's a, a black pole warbler that, that breeds in a lot of British Columbia. And they do this amazing migratory route where they fly in the fall all the way across most of Canada and they reach New England and they stop there for about two or three weeks and they feed like crazy. They just eat a lot and they gain about twice their body weight. And then they take off and they go on this incredible migration across the Atlantic Ocean 
to South America, and they winter down there. And in that, in that um, two days of flight, approximately over here, they lose all that fat that they put on during those several weeks. So pretty amazing. Uh, birds are amazing navigators. So they, uh, here's just a couple examples where people moved these Manx shearwaters from their um, nest in, in Wales in the, in the United Kingdom. So across the Atlantic, and only 12 days later, they, um, well, they released them in Boston, and only 12 days later, these birds were back in their burrows in, uh, in the UK. So they can find their way home incredibly well. I can mention on that last slide, these black-capped warblers, they'll, they'll fly all this distance, and then come back and be in the exact same breeding territory the next year. So they're able to navigate that well. These white-crowned sparrows were taken from uh, San Jose and released in Louisiana and Alaska, and they found their way home. Their, their way home. Uh, migration is such a strong instinct in birds that it can actually be studied inside the lab. You can keep a bird in a cage, and it will jump in the direction that it wants to migrate in. So you can take a bird in the, in the fall when it should be migrating south, put it in this little funnel in a lab called an Emlyn funnel, and it will jump in a certain direction. And you, you put an ink pad down here and this like white paper around the edge, and it jumps in that direction. And then you come back and you find all these jump marks where its feet hit the edge. And you count all that up and you, you figure out where it wanted to go. And it will tell you in the fall, I want to go south. If you do the experiment in the spring, it will want to go north. Um, and you can figure out, does it want to go southeast or southwest? And, do very detailed things. Now, birds, um, so birds are amazing navigators, but how do they do it? Uh, well, they, they use a lot of different things. I could talk on this for a while, but I decided just what are the neatest, way coolest um, aspects of how they navigate? And uh, I want to talk a little bit about the star compass. <clears throat> so it's been shown that birds can uh, use the stars to find out where south and north is. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? How many of us do you think, if we're put out at night somewhere, we're lost in a field, we have no GPS, no cell phone, how many of us could look at the stars and figure out where we are? Um, you could, good. I'm glad some can. <laughs> I'm glad some can. So how would you do that? How would you do that? Yeah, look. Great. Do you know where it is up here? OK, look for Polaris. You couldn't do it? Well, you, you at least you know in principle how to do it. You find, one way is to find Polaris. That's the North Star. But you could also, so early on in the 1960s, people did experiments putting birds in those Emlyn funnels and under a planetarium. And it turned out the birds could use just the information in the stars to figure out where south was. So people started thinking, ah, oh, birds are somehow born with a star map in their heads. They actually know the constellations. And they're just, they're born like that because these were birds raised from the egg. They had no adult experience. Uh, so people thought that, that birds somehow knew all the pattern of the stars in the sky. Turned out that wasn't actually happening. And a very clever experiment showed they aren't born with a star map, but what they do is almost as amazing. And that is, the young birds watch the stars move in the sky when they're young. And if you do this, if you lie out in the desert watching the sky, you'll notice the stars are moving over time. They're moving very fast over parts of the sky, very slow over other parts. And they're moving very slow over the part that's near the North Star. In fact, that's the North Star. It actually does go in a tiny little circle. And the birds then say, they, they learn where is the center of rotation, ah, it's there, and they know instinctively that is north. The center of rotation is north. Now I'll show you the, the experiment where they figured this out. They raised these little indigo buntings under two kinds of sky conditions. One, in one, they had a planetarium that was, worked just like our sky. It rotates around the North Star. Another group, though, 
they showed it the same pattern of stars in the sky, but they, the researchers rotated around a different star, Betelgeuse, in, in the constellation Orion. Well, these birds decided that that was, the cent that was north, and they then went appropriately south in the fall. So they were, they were learning where the center of rotation of the stars is, and then figuring out, ah, in the fall I need to go away from that. So they're born with that instinct. It's kind of cool. Now how about, okay, so they can use the stars. But they can also use magnetism. How many people knew this? I'm curious whether everybody knows. How many people knew that birds can sense the magnetic field? Okay, mo most, most people. Um, so they can, it, it's, it's quite amazing. So the, the Earth is a giant magnet, essentially. It's got a north um, magnetic pole and a south magnetic pole. Now we all use cell phones to kind of uh, use GPS to figure out our way, but everyone used to use compasses when I was a kid, where the little needle swings to the to north. I don't know how many kids see that, <laughs> that these days. But uh, anyway, the birds can do this. And so a lot of people have been figuring out why or how do they do this. And the, the result is quite amazing. It appears that they're seeing the magnetic field. They, they don't see this compass here the, on that. But the idea here, a lot of experiments have shown that birds in Emlyn funnels can navigate when a certain kind of light is available, but in the dark they don't do it. They, they, they don't navigate in the same way. And there are these proteins called cryptochromes that have been found in the eyes of birds. And you can imagine in your eye that you have these little opsins in your eye that are absorbing the, the light. And if a cryptochrome were attached to an opsin, it can alter the way light is absorbed in your eye and can actually change the absorption of different opsins. So the idea is if a bird looks in parallel with the magnetic field, it sees one shade of light. If it looks perpendicular, it sees another shade. So they may be flying along in a scene like this. We would see it like this, but they might see these the, these different sort of colors imposed on the, the thing, and that might tell them, ah, oh, there's a magnetic field line at that, that direction. So it appears that that's actually what they're doing. Um, now, one interesting thing about um, bird migration is that different populations of the same species sometimes have very different migratory routes. And we call these migratory divides. So here the Pacific wren and the winter wren that breed together in northeast BC have very different routes to their wintering areas. The same is true for these other pairs of, of western and eastern forms. And we've been using something called geolocators to track birds on my migration. So here's a Swainson's thrush wearing a geolocator. Um, that's how big they are compared to a penny. And these devices uh, just have a little light stock on them and a little clock. And you put it on the bird and you let the bird go and it flies to South America and then it comes back and you go back to that breeding site and try to catch the bird again. And if you do, you can download the data. So you get a list of the light level for every two minutes over the year. And from that, um, let's see, do I? Yeah, so how, can anyone tell me how we infer location of the bird each day of the year from just knowing the light level every two minutes? Anyone figure that out? Yeah? Yeah, so we can infer the length of the day um, for each day the bird was out there from you know, the time, time between the sun coming up and sun going down. That's the length of the day. So that tells you something about latitude, right? And what about longitude? How do we get that, how east or west it is? Yes? Yeah, I like the time zone. So basically, when does the sun come up in the morning is different at, at every longitude on Earth. So we can figure out the longitude and the latitude. So Kira Delmore, my PhD student, has been doing this work. She's she um, had a, a, a western form of Swainson's thrush here and an eastern form up in Kamloops. And she put these geolocators on birds there. 
And she recovered um, data from nine birds, five from these areas and four from Kamloops. And these are the routes they showed. So these ones from Vancouver are migrating down the west coast of North America down to the Yucatan Peninsula. And they're coming back that way. And the ones inland a little bit are going way down to Alabama and then down to South America and coming back that way. So this is a very, um, this, is, this is a classic migratory divide, sort of, these very different routes. Now here's where it gets interesting. These two birds, these two groups of birds hybridize right here. What do you think the hybrids do? So hybrids meaning, um, you know, a male from one group mates with a female from another group, and they produce a, an offspring here that has a genetic mixture. Oh, and one thing I forgot to say is that these birds are not following their parents on their migration. They, they're migrating alone, generally at night, and their parents have already left. So the birds are following very instinctive routes. They have their, their genes somehow are telling them, go this way or go that way. And so what do you think hybrids in the middle here between these two groups would do? Yeah? yeah. Go in the middle, yeah. And you're right. OK, I'll show you this really quick. So, uh, OK, so then she put in the Pemberton and Hope, she put geolocators on birds there. That's in the middle of the hybrid zone. Uh, and uh, got a bunch back. She got six hybrids back in this one year. And here's the, the black roots are the roots you just saw from the western group and the eastern group. And the colored roots are the hybrids. So a lot of them, like this orange one, went right down the middle here and, um, and then came back up that same way. And we think that that middle route is not as good as the two other routes because it's going through desert areas, you know, in, in the, like it's going through places like uh, Utah and Arizona and uh, Nevada, places like that, where there are lots of deserts, not as much food to eat on the way. So, <clears throat> um, so hybrids really do take intermediate routes, and uh, some routes are mixed. Um, so some, some interestingly take the, the eastern route down and the western route back. So why, basically, why is it ethical to do this kind of work? And that's something we, sci we, we think of. Do you know what ethical means? Sorry, why is it right to do this no, kind of work? I mean, yeah. Why they don't let us keep the well, so um, when scientists do this, it's highly regulated. Like I have to apply for permits to the Migratory Bird Treaty Act people. And we have to justify, like, what is the value of this work? What information do we get? How will it help us understand species so that we can conserve them in the wild? For instance, from this, it's a very Im Im an important result is, uh, is uh, all these birds that stopped in Alabama, that's a really important place for these, this species. They all stop here and they feed for like two weeks before they cross, cross the water. So it tells us that result and that's important. It tells us we need to conserve habitat in that area. I want to thank um, Ildiko Zabo in particular for helping get these specimens together. So thank you very much. And thanks to all of you for coming. Thanks.